Uh, so we have come to the last session of our uh, quite a long conference. Uh, and I give the floor to Anders Kurg, uh, who is an architectural historian and senior researcher at the Institute of Art History and Visual Culture, Estonian Academy of Arts in Tallinn. His research explores architectural and art practices in the Soviet Union from the late 60s to the, uh, to the 1980s. And his uh, paper is titled Beyond Comparison, Writing the History of Postmodern Architecture in the Soviet Union. Please. Thank you very much. So I'm partly continuing these discussions that were invoked uh, during the last panel. In her overview from 1995 on the use of the term postmodernism in Estonian art world, art historian Eja Dreyer stated that the, and I quote, recognition of the postmodern condition in Estonia almost coincided uh, with that of the West. The first ones who consciously brought about the postmodern condition in their work were the architects, the so-called Tallinn School, who produced postmodern works already in the late 1970s, projects which were built in the early 1980s, unquote. According to Dreyer, postmodernism was understood in the modernist idiom as a new and progressive state step in the development of art. In her opinion, the broader background and content of this art, as it had emerged in the West, was not recognized. But it was given a new content related to the local architectural reality, and this mostly consi consisted of opposition to mass housing, uh, a new kind of relationship to the historic uh, city, and so on. And she added, uh, I quote, in the confrontation between architectural generations, the term postmodernist became a pejorative term already in the 1980s. Nevertheless, the architects unwittingly predicted the arrival of pluralism and important breaks that took place in that society only at the end of the 1980s, unquote. I chose to start with this passage by Treya for three reasons. Firstly, I want to expand on this periodization of postmodernism to situate the critical moment of postmodernism to the late 1970s and early 1980s, and what she means that it becomes a pejorative term or even a curse word by the end of 1980s among the architects. This means that contrary to some Central European periodizations that see postmodernism in the Eastern Bloc to be the cultural representation of perestroika or even post-socialism, uh, as Charles Jenks has said, Postmodernists can, view, can be viewed as the architecture of the late Brezhnev period, or the so-called developed socialist, as it was officially term, termed. Secondly, I'm interested in the ways in which postmodernists grew out from the social and economic circumstances of the period, and, it, and, and this is mostly I'm concentrating on the economic difference between the town and the country, but in advantage of the country, quite uh, unexpe unexpectedly as well as the critical discussions that emerged at the time. So rather than copying the West without recognizing the context, as Freya says, I want to investigate the possibility of expanding the ways we understand the term postmodernism. This is related to a larger project, project I'm pursuing and that I sort of uh, put in my abstract, uh, which was very general, I, I, I know it. Uh, on, on the ways in which we could bring the East European material together with the dominant Western master narrative, thereby decentering the concept. And finally, I'm also, I'm probably not dealing with that so much here, but I'm also interested in this, this idea of postmodernists predicting the changes of the late 1980s, or if it would be possible to relate it to the prehistory of the Velvet Revolution or, or the Singing Revolution in the Baltic countries. So, although during the period of perestroika and the years that followed immediately after it, it became popular to denote the preceding Brezhnev era, that is from 1964-82, as that of stagnation. It is not the most suitable term for the analysis of architecture. The Brezhnev period was long, with several changes, and it could be divided into many sub-periods. There was a stable growth up until 1973, with rising wages, increasing urbanization, and the emergence of the Soviet version of consumer society. The second half of the 60s saw important attempts at restructuring economic management and planning in the country with the hope that institutional innovation would increase plummeting growth rates and make production processes more efficient. In the so-called Kosovian reforms, aimed after the Prime Minister of the Brezhnev era, 
An attempt was made to decentralize decision making over production, uh, over production by delegating it from planners to producers and factories and to motivate the work with incentives from profits and sales rather than solely by output. Um, the reform also proposed a stimulus system for innovation in order to encourage more efficient work processes and generating new products. The idea was to progress via a long-term perspective from single enterprises to multi-plant corporations um, that would plan their production and distribution in a coordinated way. Although implementation of most of these reforms was shelved in the early 1970s, the initiatives could nevertheless be seen as leading to the adaptation, adoption of several new management innovations. In 1974, for example, the first agrarian industrial complex in the Soviet Union was organized on the basis of agricultural farms of the Viljandi region in Estonia. The idea behind the complex was to coordinate more efficiently the collaboration of productive and processing industries, finding additional incentives for weaker cooperative farms, and manage agricultural production according to the logic of industrial production. The second agrarian industrial complex in Estonia was formed in 1979 in Bernu, and by 1981, the management reform had been carried out in all Estonian regions in, in agriculture. Mergers between collective farms had more intensively started already in the second half of the 1960s, where smaller and weaker farms were combined with more prosperous ones, producing in this way bigger production units with higher profitability. By the end of the same decade, also sovhouses um, or the state farms that had been eco economically less successful, went over to a system of self-management that had allowed them to retain their profits and redirect them into their own production and salaries. One of the main problems for communal farms, and I, I, I use the term communal farms for colophosis and so forth, is to combine. So one of the main <coughs> problems for communal farms was the lack of skilled labor. To fight their migration to cities, colophosis raised their salaries and for example, in 1985, the average salary in Estonian colleges was 272 rubles, while the, whole, uh, while the average salary in the whole country was only 153 rubles. And, and they paid a lot of attention to the living condition in the countryside, offering not only better housing, but also better possibilities for leisure time. In the more prosperous colleges, individual homes could be bought with a loan that could be even erased for better workers. A large amount of the profits were directed to erecting new cultural centers. Um, and, and the reviewer complained uh, at some point in, in, the, uh, in, in a journal of agriculture that why do, why do all the smaller villages need a cultural house with a full stage equipment? That should, maybe they could be smaller ones, but here you see like three culture houses with, with full stage equipment so that the uh, theater troops could come and give performances in the countryside, so the people would have the same quality of entertainment as in bigger cities. Um, and paid a lot of... Uh, uh, so, culture houses, clubs, kindergarten, schools, and making payments for the inter-farm sanatorium and seaside resorts. Additionally, state resources, were uh, state resources were also directed to the construction in the countryside, for example, in 1984, rural social cultural objects and residential buildings were declared a priority of funding, and 15% of the production of house construction factories was, was directed to the countryside. Architecture became, in the 1970s and 1980s, in many ways a means for these communal farms and, and countryside smaller villages for their own image making and differentiation, with some collective farms even hiring their own chief architect and occasionally a whole design bureau. For example, in Vimsi, the Kira uh, Fisherman Kolhoz had a, had a design office. Um, a well-known story, uh, in 1966, a special design office uh, specializing on collective farm construction was formed on the initiative of inter-farm construction offices called the Ekebrek, that by the end of the 1970s employed more, more than 1,000 people. Um, it was supported by more or less independent clients. Uh, they had access to a wide range of building materials. And this office became a main initiator of change in architecture in Estonia in 1970s and 1980s. So there was already, Maria mentioned the Tallinn School. But there were, um, from the 1960s, there was a generation of architects who started work in the Eka project, including Thomas Rein, Vela Vasik, El Vartno, Rey Domingas, Mary Drew, <coughs> so, 
So besides coming all from the State Art Institute, Faculty of Architecture, they were also joined together by the critique of industrialization of the building practice and dominant mass housing, but also the Soviet version of consumerism and the so-called parvenu culture that they were criticizing. Architecture for them had to be related to other fields, especially visual arts, that since the 1960s had been revolutionized by pop art. And I have written uh, about the Italian school and, and this group previously and, and spoken about their exhibitions. This is done, a group photograph of the so-called Italian 10 um, during their exhibition in 1982, uh, December in Italian Art Hall. So it's in a way uh, uh, in front of an architect which nicely um, tells about this, this arrival uh, of postmodernism in the very early 80s. But I, I want to concentrate today on one of the leading figures of, of this group, uh, Wilhelm Künnapo, who is um, standing here, um, who, who in, in terms of, uh, could be considered to be most representative in the terms of the postmodern term. Künnapo started working at Ekeprojekt after graduating from the State Art Institute in 1972 at the age of 24. It is not insignificant for the sake of my story here, that he came from a family of first-generation communist leaders. Uh, his father had been a Red Army major during the Second World War. His aunt, Olga Lauristin, had been a minister of cinematography in the 1940s and held several leading positions in the Estonian um, SSR later. Indeed, Kynapu's first name, Wilhelm, was a revolutionary name made up of the initials um, of the first half of initials and the first half of Lenin's name. Um, already in the early 1970s, Kynapu became one of the leading voices of his generation, writing articles in popular press on recent changes in architecture, introducing figures like Louis Kahn, Alison and Peter Switzerland, but also Robert Venturi, um, Russian constructivism, uh, the Nier group uh, from the 60s, and gaining attention with his own projects. Um, I think this is actually my... In 1974, he won the internal competition of the Ecke project uh, for a large sanatorium building in Berno, where he interpreted the late modern idea of microenvironments in a context of a small town. Here, the large program of the building, which consisted of a dormitory, um, sports hall, swimming pool, cultural building, a water procedures building, uh, administrative unit, so um, it has been broken down into different smaller functional units that were lined up on two sides of the extension of an existing street and then connected on the first floor level with a system of galleries running above the street. Um, this is how it was, how it looked. Uh, from the same period was a group of um, five neo-modernist single-family dwellings uh, for Aravete Kolhoz administration members, and Aravete was one of these Kolhozes that had recently emerged and became a big corporation in, in some sense. Uh, so the, the, the head, um, the elite of the Kolhoz, the chairman, the vice chairman, the chief agronomist, uh, built their villas by the lakeside um, um, in Karavete. It's, it's a small um, uh, village near the Kolhoz center. Here, the object like the exterior was further underlined by the way white walls were seamlessly joined the surface of the grass. Um, the chief agron agronomist's house had a greenhouse that opened to the center of stair halls and gave an indication of the inhabitants' profession. Um, it's also, I think, the drawing is quite uh, characteristic of Kunapu's uh, preferences and ideals at the time, reminding perhaps of James Sterling's. Um, axonometric drawings, or maybe the later New York Five axonometric drawings. Uh, Kynapu's approach, however, changed considerably by the end of the 1970s and early 1980s, moving towards historicist quotations and interesting historical typologies. In August 1977, he published in a cultural newspaper, Serpio Azar, a polemical article called Environment Through a Myth, where on the one hand he praised the ideas of the machine age and the use of technicist details in organizing new environments, but turned towards a more poetic imagination while discussing works done for individual clients in single family dwellings. And so I quote Gunnapu here Houses contain thousands of associations, hidden and unconscious ones, that is, memories and illusions, as well as public and conspicuous ones, that is, advertisements, laundry drying on the roof, windows, and so on. 
While creating new urban structures, we should take into account the associations brought up by the neighborhood and add to these new associations." Unquote. So according to Kunapu, the architect had to produce a myth, a story of the house during, this, the, during the design process that would, uh, and this is again a quotation, that would co consist of the future user's illusions, their subconscious dreams. Unquote. In order to understand these desires of the client, of the future user, but also to come up with new symbols, this approach suggested to carry out thorough conversations with the clients during the design process. The article invoked a broad polemic in the newspaper, obviously, uh, including a critical response by architectural historian Leo Gens, actually quoted already today, who interpreted the myth uh, making or myth, uh, interpreted the myth as a possibility for Nuborish or, or social climbers to differentiate themselves from others to show that they were better than their neighbors. Yet there were other voices from the power center that saw in the postmodern orientation towards the user also possibility for Soviet architecture. Writing a couple of years later in Dekorativne Iskustva, in one of the first articles introducing postmodernists to Soviet audience, Ideology Secretary of the Soviet Architects' Union, Alexander Radushin and Vladimir Haidt noted that while one has to view the rise of postmodernism in the context of Western capitalism, um, some, as they said, artistic takes and professional methods, while given new ideological content, offer practical interest also in the context of different social systems. So they had obviously in mind uh, communist or socialist Soviet Union. In the turn towards meaning and symbolism, they saw a potential of addressing different groups of people and telling different stories. Unlike the techno-utopian architecture that had to fit everyone in the same way, there was a turn towards the ideals of the common man, as they said. Meaningful architecture means, and this is a quote, uh, meaningful architecture means turning towards the ground, centuries-long truth of human history and human culture. Unquote. One of the most known Kunapu's works from this period was a flower shop on a narrow site in Tallinn Old Town that displayed a double concrete facade, corresponding more or less to the theories of Robert Venturi, with stylized classical elements on the street side and the white, light blue rational three-story volume with roof lights standing behind it. The, the color scheme and the interior design was done by young artist Mari Gurizma, who was also mentioned today, for who it was a diploma project. So there's, there's actually quite interesting um, detail here that doesn't get noted very often that this, uh, this is not a shadow, this is a painted shadow. So this is a light blue, light blue and this is white. So the shadow is painted there as if the sun always shines. <coughs> there were many poetic interpretations published on the building, including one by Mike Wint, who titled um, there's so many associations there. Might you entitled his uh, review of the building, Liba Hunt Karya Tanavan, which uh, means where wolf on a cattle street. So the street name was Karya, the cattle street. And Liba Hunt is as a werewolf, somebody who wears a mask, but obviously it was also Hunt's own name which is in there in this title. So there, there's so, so many associations going on there. Um, and, and he interpreted the flower stall according to theories of the unconscious and so on. I'm not going to go into these details, but it's a very rich material. There was less mention of the client, however. The flower shop was commissioned by the Lauristin Golfos from Kuiwaya. The store itself was on the ground floor. Uh, on the second floor was the Golfos' office space, or the embassy of the Golfos in the city, and the roof-lit guest apartment on the top floor. The Lauristin Golfos, which was named after the writer and the first secretary of, of, first secretary of the Estonian Communist Party, Central Committee in 1940, Johannes Lauristin, um, was, was also briefly married to Olga Lauristin, uh, Kunapu's aunt. Uh, and La Lauristin had been killed um, uh, in 1941, actually quite soon. So he, he was not the leader of the Communist Party for a very long time. Um, so this kolkhoz had in 1975 merged with a neighboring kolkhoz socialist way, such as Ismitlere, becoming in this way a large agricultural estate and carrying out also several management reforms. In addition to profits from pig farming and dairy, it enlarged in the 1970s its, 
its greenhouses and started to um, produce a lot of flowers um, and, and also souvenirs. So that, that's the, they were selling them in this shop. Growing its profits already in the first year of, after the merger uh, by 80,000 rubles. The retail, and outlet, the retail outlet and office space in Tallinn could then be seen to mark a new stage in the growth of the farm and more conscious marketing of its products. So they also in 1977, they, when the idea was conceived to, to build this uh, structure, uh, they opened a cafe and bar in a nearby restored windmill. So uh, offering was more leisure spaces for their own employees. Another inter interesting topic that I don't have much Time to, oh, that's, uh, that's the interior, sorry, I forgot to. Um, this kind of representative offices of agricultural farms in the capital became common in the late 1970s, and this is a super interesting topic, I don't have to, uh, just to mark this. Um, for example, here, um, the fish, fishing farm Hero, they had an, the whole store um, and, and uh, a hotel in the center of Tallinn, um, with a bar, um, uh, with an aquarium in the basement, a flower salon and a sculpture exhibi exhibition space on the, in this atrium space on the ground floor, an exhibition space on the first floor, guest rooms on the third floor, and a sauna and a rooftop swimming pool on the fourth floor. So it was, it was, a very, uh, it was not only to show off the, the ri uh, kind of riches of the, of the estates, but the, these offices were all very important also to negotiate deals with producers of machinery, um, to invite them to their saunas and seal the deals, um, and get better equipment for, for these estates. So they are important, they really are embassies in some sense. To, to negotiate all these transactions, business transactions. Other works by Kunap at the time included a monument to the victims of fascism in Woodland Cemetery in Tallinn, on top of the common grave of 1,000 prisoners executed in August and September 1944, before the arrival of the Red Army in the end of September in the same year. It consists of an arch of polished, polished granite blocks. In front of it is a step pyramid for eternal fire, and, and, and it's not broken, it appears to be broken, but it represents the violent disruption of life and disruption of time and destruction, as Kenobi himself said. So it's, it's a postmodern um, memorial, really, with this kind of broken, um, uh, uh, broken um, uh, stones to, to represent the um, disruption of time, actually. Um, the above-mentioned design process based on a myth uh, or narrative gained its peak in several Kunapus projects from the 1980s, the most famous of which was the competition entry Silverwhite for the Rovaniemi Arctic Center, which was co-authored with Ayn Badrik and Leonard Meri, a writer who later became the first president of Estonia in the 1990s, which was awarded an honorary mention. And the main concept of this project derived from the Nordic legends that the vault of the sky is supported by an oblique pillar which meets the sky at the point of the northern star, the Stella Polaris, in which, it, which is also a channel of communication with the other side for shamans and Nordic people. And um, so the, the, the glass tower was pointing towards the Nordic star, Stella Polaris, to allow for this communication with that. Uh, with, with the other side. I'm not going to, there's a lot of other interesting interpretations. It's a white wave where the hapu would put through and so on. But um, it could be claimed, however, that Kunapu's most significant works of the period were done for the collective farms in the countryside. The administration and office building for the October collective farm in Beatri was, in architect's words, inspired by a classic classical Greek temple and had to form a horizontal counterpoint to the vertical of the church steeple nearby. The long and narrow structure built from white bricks was artic articulated by the window openings and entrances. The interior was dominated by a narrow roof-lit atrium with office spaces on two sides and the interior design again was done by Mari Gurisman. At the rear side of the building was a passage which in the middle of the fields lacked any function but which in the author's words carried a poetic role to connect two meadows 
and produced associations with the paintings of Giorgio de Chirico, inspired by Italian neo-rationalist aesthetics. So, um, I, I said I'm, I'm going beyond comparison, but I can't avoid a comparison here, really, with this Italian neo-rationalist aesthetics which Kunap was interested at this time in the role of architects that the, that the user recognizes, but also shifts the existing logic of the, uh, of the environment. So here he was clearly, uh, he, he also openly acknowledged his indebtedness to Alda uh, work at the time. Uh, the October collective farm in central Estonia had similarly grown consider considerably in the second half, in the first half of the 1970s. The small Kareta village where it was located grew in inhabitants almost in one third during these decades, with 10 new apartment buildings put up in the late 70s, a new canteen, a kindergarten added in the early 1980s. This belief in the ongoing growth of the population led to an addition to the structures for the October farm, with a club and a sports hall started in 1988 and finished already during the independence period. Here, Kunap relied on an archetype of a traditional farmhouse, although the locals called, nicknamed it a drift ship. Alongside its roof gable was a leaning light source uh, that lit the sports hall below. In front of the hall were a foyer, cafe, and winter garden in one continuous flowing space. If the comparison of the two buildings, uh, and they, they are really in, in uh, basically in the same um, the, the, like a hundred meters apart of each other, the, uh, this one, um, this one, and uh, this one. Um, if the comparison of the two buildings gives a good idea of the change of Kunapu's approach over time and the transformation of postmodernism over the decade, the scale and size of the new building is even more revealing about the expansion of the collective farm over the decade and also presumption that it will continue in a similar way in the future. So it must be said that from around 600 people living in the village at the period, by now it has dropped to 300, less than 300. And the previous building obviously stands still to the empty. Other important buildings by Kunap at the time were the Laikwere um, Center, which replaced old warehouses in the small uh, village uh, and drew its architectural language in Kunapu's words from the eclecticism of the village itself. So it combined uh, um, it combined the uh, culture hall, quite huge space with uh, offices. Um, and uh, quite funnily, it was completed in 1992, uh, and the first meeting in this um, culture hall was about reorganizing the production or that is ending the subhouse. Um, others were Balko, uh, this was a state farm, um, club and center, Kehra, uh, office and canteen, 1987, it was completed in 1992. So quickly, uh, some more things. Equally significant was the construction of private houses where the restrained vocabulary of modernists was replaced with abundance of details, gable roofs, differently shaped windows, high stone pediments and columns, or swimming pools or winter gardens when possible. One of the most extensive areas of the single family houses in the period was in Dartu near the architect's street that started in 1981 and where each of the 600 meter plot was attached to different architect. The use of, um, who was, uh, the, use of the architect was compulsory for the owner. There was, uh, however, very little restrictions to the, uh, to the architects themselves. The line of buildings and finishing of the exterior. And the invited architects included Leonhard Lapin, Veilio um, Garci, Kain Patrick, Di Kaljundi, um, also William Kunnapo. But it is also in relation to private houses, uh, private house building that Kunnapo's work faced a strong negative reaction. In 1985, the building committee, which was critical of architectural innovation, investigated several already approved designs for single family dwellings and decided that the private house by Kunakutu Meriwela, which is on the right hand side, which had classical details and the glass gallery with, with a, which looks like a greenhouse, but actually was uh, there to have a sea view uh, to, the, to the Bay of Dal Tallinn, um, was termed architecturally unprofessional, inefficient in its plan solution, and too large. 
And in an unprecedented step, he was forbidden to design single-family dwellings for four years. Um, so, to conclude, it is true that postmodernism was easily adapted to commercial values and became quickly a part of nouveau rich culture, as Gens had predicted. Having a warm garage, a greenhouse attached to the building, or a turret or a portico with classical columns could function as a means for differentiation and status symbols. This shift of values played a role also in the case of communal farming, where architecture functioned as a means of building corporate identity, as we saw. For others, postmodernism also symbolized the resistance to the dominant Soviet regime and predicted the rise of identity politics at the end of the decade, or was even called the building revolution, according to Leonhard Lapid. In, more uh, in a more critical interpretation, historicist postmodernism could be seen as a nostalgia for past life, form, past life forms, paving the way towards the neoconservative term. And this is, in a way, how I myself have um, preferred to look at it. But I think there could be a third way, and um, this is quite a tentative conclusion, but I want to spell it out to this audience here. I think there could be a third way to think about postmodernism as it emerged from this particular economic phenomenon of the communal farms. That it was a way to imagine a better living environment, put quite simply, inside the socialist framework. One that was constructed to respond to popular desires, of symbolic desires, but also others like desires for individual freedom inside the socialist framework. So, in if we think about this Petri collective farm, for example, um, they, they didn't commission one building from Gunab, but also they must have liked the first one so much that they commissioned also the second one. Or people in Laikbere have very warmly said, people who work in the cultural, um, uh, cultural center in Laikbere, that this is the best building they, are, they have ever worked in. So it is a paradox of this postmodernism that when most of these buildings were finally ready, the late socialist system that gave rise to it had already ended. Thank you.